Why are purple blasters so rare in Star Wars? I always thought it was so cool that Mace Windu was the only Jedi to have a purple lightsaber and he literally had to ask George Lucas for it himself. There's no purple lightsaber. You, you might get purple. But what about purple blasters? I've wondered this ever since I was a little kid watching Attack of the Clones and saw those little Geonosian starfighters zip on screen and start blasting our heroes. They shoot these beautiful purple blaster bolts and I think they look so cool and so unique. The Hailfire droids, their purple missiles look awesome too. And most recently in the Book of Boba Fett, we finally see our first blaster pistol ever that shoots purple. And for me, this was personally one of my favorite details in the entire show. But why is there just these two instances in in all of Star Wars. We have red, which is the most common, and then we have the entire Imperial Navy using green, which looks awesome. Blue was used during the Clone Wars. We even have yellow, which the Mandalorians use, as well as the Imperials for training purposes. And we even see some snipers that shoot it. But then we just have one purple blaster in all of Star Wars. Why is there not more? I actually reached out and asked the actor that plays this character just because I wondered if he simply asked the director for it, like Samuel L. Jackson did. And the answer he gave me I was not expecting. We're going to talk about that in literally every single source I could find in the last 30 days that could give us a clue to why purple blasters are so rare to see. If you'd like to know the canon reason of why blasters shoot different colors in the world of Star Wars, then this is the video for you. My goal was that this would be the definitive video for that using every tidbit of information they'd given us going all the way back to 1984 with the very first Star Wars reference book I could find. I'll probably put a little footer at the bottom of the screen during the video for my sources with the title and publication date just because there will be so many throughout the entire video, so please bear with me. Hello there. And as much as I'd like to just say purple blasters consist of argon or something and that's why they emit the purple glow, there is just so much more to it than that. And I feel like we need to just start by getting the obvious answer out of the way. Yes, at face value, the different colors are mainly intended to color code opposing forces. In the original trilogy, the rebels shot all red, while the entirety of the Imperial Navy all shot green. The TIE Fighters, the Turbo Lasers, even the Death Star itself. And while this does make it easier to interpret space battles and see who's shooting who, isn't it backwards? Shouldn't red be for the bad guys and good guys are green? Well, normally yes, but for the original trilogy, Lucas took heavy inspiration from World War II, where the Allies used red tracers and the Axis mainly used green. That's why the colors seem to be flipped. But then, when you get to the Clone Wars, all the clones use blue shots while all of the Separatists shoot red. This is more along the lines of what you'd expect the good and bad guys to be color-coded as. This is used so extremely in Clone Wars that sometimes factions using one color will change colors of blaster fire in the same episode whether they are fighting with the good guys versus the bad guys. Which is a little comical, and the only reason good guys using blue doesn't make sense is when Disney decided to continue this pattern and use it in the sequels. The Resistance chose to use blue, while the First Order uses red, and I'll explain that in a minute, it just doesn't make sense, but basically, that's the real world answer of why blasters are different colors. Hopefully that eliminates a ton of good guys bad guys comments. Now let's start exploring why blasters are actually different colors, and to start getting into the lore of it, we need a brief explanation of how a blaster actually works, and this is actually not one solid answer. As I'm sure you can imagine, a lot of changes happen in the 47 years since the first movie came out, and blaster explanations have slightly fluctuated over the years. The Bread Circus did a great video on this if you want to know more about all the differences and the technicality of how a blaster functions, but for this video, we're going to go back and look at the oldest information I could find. So there's two main components of a blaster, the gas chamber and the power pack. The gas chamber can be filled up with any number of energy-rich gases. Most use the more commonly found Tabana gas. This is what Lando was mining in Cloud City. What have we here? Power packs could easily be replaced, but replacing the gas was a little harder. Power packs could last 100 shots in an E11, but the gas chamber needs to be refilled every 500 shots. And to do that, you would have to put a small gas canister to the back of the blaster to the refill valve and manually put gas in it. When you fire a blaster, a small amount of the gas goes into a converter where energy from the power pack excites the gas. Then it goes through the actuating module that converts it into a particle beam, which is then sent through the focusing crystal and out the 
the barrel where it is a glowing bolt of energy. Now this is the main process that's echoed throughout a lot of the books, but all of the extra details are where it gets a little bit fuzzy. In 1987, the Star Wars source book said that blasters usually output their power in the visual light spectrum so that the gunner can see where his shots are going, like the real world tracers we talked about earlier. But this also said that some lasers can be altered to change their beam color to any wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. This allows such vessels to attack invisibly by firing in the non-visible spectrum to gain initial surprise. But because such attacks can be detected by sophisticated electronic defense systems, this tactic is only of limited effectiveness. And in 1997, the first essential guide to weapons and technology backed this up by saying that the bolt of visible light is a harmless byproduct of the reaction. Almost saying the visible bolt of light we see is like the muzzle flash on a gun. It's not the bullet, just a byproduct. But in this case, it continues to travel along the path of the high energy particles and usually hits the target around the same time. I can't help but think that this was just an excuse for some of the on-screen minor frame errors where you see someone get hit a frame or two before the bolt looks like it actually hits them. Now, back to the source book from 1987. It said that blasters usually come with an intensity setting, providing the user with everything from stun mode to full power. And on its highest setting, a blaster is capable of vaporizing almost any material it hits. And the new essential guide to weapons and tech from 2004 established that the non-lethal stun feature normally renders the victim unconscious for up to 10 minutes, and the CR2s that we see the Naboo Royal Guard using at Thede in episode 1 had a secondary fire mode that shot concentrated electricity to stun their targets. Which sounds like an actual stun bolt rather than lowering the intensity to stun. This book says that the low powered stun setting on blasters overloads a target's nervous system and renders them temporarily paralyzed. This was a short range setting no matter what the blaster's normal range was. In fact, Han's DL-44 had a really neat feature of its own built into it. In 1991, Kraken's Rebel Field Guide was published, which is an awesome book if you get the chance to check it out. But it says that originally you could half squeeze a blaster's trigger, specifically the DL-44, and an even smaller amount of gas than normal would be released into the chamber and excited, but there was only enough energy released to produce a small amount of light which was focused by the barrel. You were able to use the light coming out of your barrel to pinpoint where your shots would hit. It was like a laser pointer, but it was aimed directly from the center of your barrel. This is a really cool feature I never knew about. Also, if you're enjoying the video, go down and blast the subscribe button. I've got more fun Star Wars videos I'm working on that you're not going to want to miss. Now, in the way of changing color, this goes all the way back to 1984, one year after Return of the Jedi came out. Del Rey published a guide to the Star Wars universe. This was the earliest Star Wars informational book I could find, and it says that depending on the blaster's design, the energy bolts will vary in color and that the intensity of the blaster may be adjusted to stun an individual. The color explanation was very vague here. It could be the actual company that manufactured it was the one determining the color. It could be about anything. And it established that setting the blaster to stun was literally just lowering the intensity of it. In 87, back to the source book, it said that not only depending on the blaster's design, but also its power output and the blaster's current setting will determine the color of the energy bolt, saying that it was also a power output factor in what setting you used. Here, I'm sure referencing the blue stun blast from A New Hope. The next mention of color variation was in the Rebels Field Guide from 91, where it was the first source to establish that different gases provide not only different power levels, but also different colored bolts. And then it goes on to list a bunch of different kinds of gases that we still see around today, which we'll get to in a second. We're not done with color though. To add to the blaster's design, power output, setting, and gas used, the Star Wars Technical Journal from 94 adds that it also had to do with the internal lens arrangement, which I want to say I think refers to the focusing crystal, because I have no idea what the internal lens is in a blaster. Most diagrams just show the crystal to focus it, so I feel like it's referring to the crystal acting as a lens, focusing the particle beam. It also said the weapon's manufacturer played a role in the color of the bolt, but I think that just fits into the blaster's design. Now, in Star Wars Fact File number 7 from O2, it says for the first time that the TIE Fighter's distinct green beams were caused by the frequency of the laser's modulating crystal. Now, this is interesting for multiple reasons. One, it completely contradicts the recent explanation for green laser bolts in Star Wars. And two, it feeds into an entirely different theory not mentioned anywhere else. 
As we all know, all light itself is energy, and it travels in waves. Light with a longer wavelength, like red, at the far side of the spectrum, has less energy than light with a shorter wavelength, like yellow, and then green, and blue, and then last, purple. Red light wavelengths are almost twice as long as purple light wavelengths. And while this is just a theory, a GAME THEORY, in Star Wars that the blaster color on the spectrum relates to how powerful the bolts are, I do have data behind some purple blasters to actually back this up with how effective they are that we're going to talk about deeper in the video. Now, in the Star Wars Fact File 45 from later in 2002, it said that less refined or impure Tabana gas will yield different color bolts ranging anywhere from red to blue to green, which means that the color also had to do with how refined a gas was. In the book Weapon of a Jedi from 2015, Luke posing as a hyperspace scout tells a stormtrooper he's off to refuel a Tabana gas deposit of the good stuff called interstellar gas, which is a more pure form of Tabana. In 2004, the new essential guide to weapons and tech said that as well as the gas used, it also was determined by the crystal in the blaster, which I think is what they were trying to say with the internal lens arrangement. And then in 2012, this book backed it up by saying the exact same thing. Color is determined by the gas and the crystal. And I do wonder if they meant the frequency of the crystal or the origin or shape or some other factor as well. So honestly, at this point in time, color of the blaster bolt is determined by its design, its power output and what setting it's using, and then what gas you're using and how refined it is. And then the crystal. So many more things affect color than I originally thought. When the blaster was first developed, they tested a variety of different gases to see which of them would produce the most intense packets of light. Researchers found that six of the more common gases, including Orvith, Sig, and Protheum, would work equally as good. This is from Galaxy Guide 2 Yavin and Bespin from 1989. Most munitions companies across the galaxy used one of these six gases in the production of blasters. One test led to the discovery that if certain gases are isolated, spin sealed, and compressed on the atomic level, they transmit four times the energy of the same gas not in a spin sealed state. When gas is spin sealed, the light is altered so that it reacts more violently with certain types of armor coatings causing more damage. But the research to spin seal the gas was extremely expensive so no one could afford to do it. It requires such extreme temperatures and pressures that only a few labs in the entire galaxy were able to make this. Bespin was able to do this and that was their secret to their wealth. Everyone only thought they mined the Tabana gas to use this hyperdrive engine coolant, but on the down low, they were selling it to secret groups of arms manufacturers. They were keeping it quiet to avoid any imperial interest. <laughs> Now I know this book only mentioned three of the six common gases. In the Rebel Field Guide, it said that as well as the three mentioned in Galaxy Guide, there was also Eliton, which is actually what we see Cassian Andor carrying in Rogue One, as well as Tolium and Skeven. And it was said that the spin-sealed Tabana gas was equally as powerful, but way harder to find. Since the Empire was super strict on regulating who can purchase which gases for weapons usage, they offered certain corporations monopolies over gas mining and distribution, which made it even harder for the Alliance to get their gases for their weapons. There were encounters where rebel fleets were merely a distraction because of lack of blaster gases. Now, here it established Tabana gas to be as equally powerful as all the other standard gases. But a couple years later, in a guide to the Star Wars universe from 94, it says that the spin sealed Tabana gas's energy output is four times more powerful than when it's not, in that personal weapons could not withstand the extra yield, so ship-mounted blasters benefited from the use of Tabana gas. It was saying that this spin seal Tabana was so powerful that personal weapons weren't able to handle all that power. And this was backed up in 08 with the Star Wars Encyclopedia saying that it was rare and personal weapons couldn't tolerate the extra power, so it was mainly used for ship-mounted blasters, and that most of the non-spin sealed Tabana gas was used for the standard hyperdrive coolant. There was actually a specifically engineered isotope of Tabana gas called Tabana Tabana X, made by x -Tib Corp for Incom Industries, to use in their stealth starfighters to minimize their ion trails. These were the Jedi-exclusive Stealth X fighters used by Luke Skywalker's New Jedi Order. This gas made the ship's ion emissions cool in milliseconds, making the ships extremely hard to track, and here it says that raw Tabana absorbs photon energy at 52.5% efficiency, which is extremely high, but more refined Tabana that has been naturally forged and irradiated in pressure currents found in middle layers of gas giant absorb photons at 79.6% efficiency, making it even more powerful. There was an actual organization established to regulate overpowered blaster gas. In Rise of the Separatists, published in 2019, we learned about the Bureau of Sig, Spice, and Slavery, or S3 for short. 
It was an intelligence collection and analysis agency whose job was literally to examine weapons, spice, and slaves recovered from arrests and trace them back to the bad guys and create a map of all of these criminal networks they discovered. It said that criminals used to favor SIG blaster gas because it had armor-piercing qualities but unfortunately was so inaccurate and was almost banned. So on top of the five different base things that determine your blaster's color, there's also so many different blaster gases and different variations you could use that did different things and caused different reactions. The very first blaster bolt we ever saw was the common red blaster bolt, and we quickly see how effective it is, not only against the rebellion but also against the armor-plated stormtroopers. And then we're introduced to the stun setting. This blue ring fired out of the stormtrooper Z11, this low power setting shuts down Leia's nervous system for 10 minutes and while not lethal, it is still very effective. And here's a question for all the people that think they know Star Wars. Besides this blue stun blast? <laughs> When do you think the next time we saw a blue blaster was? Attack of the Clones, when the gunships showed up and we saw our first clones? Well, if you said this, you are partially right. To the 1% who knows the correct answer, and no, it's not the Gungans' blue balls, I'm talking about the Empire Strikes Back, TIE Fighters. Yup. Usually TIE Fighters shoot green all the way from Rogue One through the original trilogy all the way through the sequels and into the Mandalorian. But there is one instance where the TIE Fighters are literally shooting blue. I'm sure many of you know that there's been countless re-releases of these movies ever since 1982. The complete Star Wars trilogy is now in our galaxy. That was the very first home video release of A New Hope on VHS. In 84, Empire was released and in 86, Return of the Jedi came out. In 1992, all three original movies re-released in the Letterbox Collector's Edition. May the trilogy be with you for the best price ever. Yes! Mm. And then in 1995, they re-released with the original versions of the films one last time digitally mastered in THX. And then from there, two years later, we got the special editions with all the stuff George added, and then they repacked and re-released them in 2000 with proper 4, 5, and 6 numbers to match the look of the Phantom Menace VHS. Then they got released as DVDs in 2004. The unaltered editions got another release in 06, and then in 2011 got a Blu-ray release. And then four years after that, a Steelbook Blu-ray release. And then they changed the art and got another re-release in 2019, including all the Disney films. What I'm trying to say is there's been a lot of versions of Star Wars, and only one of them has blue TIE Fighters. This version, actually. This was the THX release from 1995. Right after Han leaves Hoth and they're being chased by TIE Fighters, something weird happens. As you can see, they start out shooting green, and then this next shot? They are shooting extremely blue. I have no idea why, but yeah, these TIE Fighters are shooting blue. It happens in this next scene, too. The weird thing is, these shots in the releases before and after the THX one are all normal. They're all normal TIE Fighter green. It's only this release, which is so weird. It happens as Han flies into the asteroid field in these next two shots too. There's very little information on this, and while I know it was an unintentional error since it was green in the editions before and after this, it still presents a fun theory of the TIE Fighters being able to switch to an ionized or stun setting to short out their targets, disabling them but leaving them intact so they can be captured alive. Plus, I don't know why, but it looks so cool seeing the TIE Fighters shoot blue here. Right after this, they go back to shooting green though. But it actually happens with a different color later in the movie too. At the very end, Luke's hanging out waiting for a ride on Cloud City, and after they grab him and take off, the TIEs chasing them start shooting white. Like pure white. No idea why, it's most likely just another random FX error since it's fixed in all the other versions, and even in this next shot it goes back to green. But in universe, it'd kinda be cool if the gaseous atmosphere of Cloud City is what was interacting with the plasma bolts and causing a chemical reaction, making them turn white, and then when they leave the atmosphere it goes back to normal. But that's just a fun theory. If you have any behind the scenes info on why ties shoot blue, comment down below. In the Star Wars trilogy scrapbook that came out in 97, there's actually a picture of a stormtrooper here on Bespin shooting a blue blaster bolt. But I mean, grain of salt because there's also a picture of Obi-Wan and Darth Vader both with blue lightsabers. I mean, people had no idea that this was the ultimate teaser of their previous fight coming summer of 2005. I have the high ground! I 
All right, now let's get back on track. Besides these, technically the first time we see intentional blue bolts was in this glorious scene. The clones are the ones that started the entire Clone Wars era of the blue and red fire exchange. These true blue bolts were created using Tabana gas and were hyper ionized. The perks of shooting ionized blaster bolts are that theoretically they'll be more effective against machinery, or in this case, the droids that they're fighting. Although they do use them extensively against the droids, it seems that they are absolutely just as effective shooting standard targets that are not electrical and are just as deadly. F's in chat boys. And we also need to mention the orange blaster bolt, which we saw briefly in A New Hope with the training droid. <laughs> According to the Star Wars Trilogy Scrapbook from 97, these bolts are stinging non-lethal blasts. We later see more of these in Clone Wars as the clones are running through simulations. And just the same, they shoot a more cyan blaster bolt closer to the color of how Luke's lightsaber used to originally look. This is their version of a low-powered training round. Now, the first time we see purple blaster bolts are in this movie as well. We actually first see the purple flak explosions on Geonosis, which I cannot figure out for the life of me where they're coming from. We then see the Hailfire droids with their purple missiles, which look sick, and then we see the Geonosian starfighters. These are escorting Dooku when Anakin and Obi-Wan start chasing him down, only for the starfighters to just rip into them with these beautiful purple blasters, and that's it. That's all the purple blasters we got was those two minutes at the end of Attack of the Clones. 18 years pass before we got more purple blasters. And last but not least, we have yellow. We first saw this in Clone Wars, the Death Watch shoots yellow blaster bolts out of their Wester 35s, which looks so cool, and I can't help but wonder if they use local gas from Concord Dawn or Mandalore or something that gives these bolts penetrating qualities that makes them effective against their Beskar armor. Now as cool as yellow is, I think purple looks way cooler and we see it way less. Yellow is also used in some sniper rifles, it's seen in Rebels a couple of times, we see Mandalorians use it some more. We actually get to see it in live action for the first time, in the Mandalorian which was really cool, and then we also see that the Empire uses yellow bolts for training purposes. Which also explains why it's more than the color that means something. If Mandalorians are using it to be effective against Beskar armor, it's extremely likely it's more powerful or can penetrate more than the standard red or blue blaster bolts, but at the same time we see Imperials using it as a practice round. We ended up seeing yellow a lot more than we ever see of purple, which is why purple is way more rare than any of the other colors we've ever seen. Up until 2021, we had never seen anything on screen that wasn't a vehicle shoot a purple blast. The first purple energy thing was actually the pod racers energy binders, which is just electromagnetic energy between two generators to hold the engines together. This was made from an unknown energy, and if you remember, contact with them would stun the nerves and make that part of your body go numb for hours. <laughs> The pod racer engines themselves ran off of tradium power fluid, which was a specialized pod racing fuel designed for maximum power, along with ionized injectin, which is what activated the power fluid. The energy binders have their own generator that they run off of, so they're not taking any power from the engines using the pod racing fuel, but nothing specifies what these generators are powered by. And very similarly, we have the Magna Guards. These were first seen in Revenge of the Sith as Grievous's personal bodyguards. They carry these purple electro staffs, which look absolutely awesome, and we see them a lot in Clone Wars as well. The purple energy on their electro staffs is an electromagnetic pulse mainly used to fight against Jedi with lightsabers. It runs off of two energy cells, one in each end of the staff that power an EMP field generator used to create the purple end of electricity. There's no information on what type of power cell was in the electro staffs, but they had multiple power settings including stun, standard, and full power that could tear an opponent in half. This was from the Force and Destiny role-playing game from 2015. The first time Grievous's Magna Guards were used was on the fourth moon of Perrine 2. Jedi General Sanin was leading the Republic forces while Grievous was leading his droids into battle, obliterating the Republic forces. Sanin tried to tackle Grievous but didn't get to him in time and was stabbed through the throat by a Magna Guards electrostaff. These could very well be using similar power sources to the Pod Racer's energy binders, but on a much more compact and violent scale. These two could shut down a nervous system, but their intensity could also be turned up to tearing through organic tissue. Now there was also a bow rifle we see Zeb use in Rebels that is both a blaster rifle and a staff. While it does shoot red blaster bolts, the staff itself glows a purple electromagnetic pulse. The Rebels Epic Battles visual guide establishes that the tips of the staff can carry a maximum charge of 11,000 volts. 
I would assume the build is similar to a standard Electrostaff where the EMP tips has their own power cells separate from the blaster's power pack. There was also a yellow version that Agent Callus used. This was a later model, while Zeb's was one of the earlier ones. We also got a version in EA's Battlefront that only had one singular tip on the end of the rifle and the electricity on the end was yellow as well. It didn't seem that the yellow or purple bow rifle performed any different from one another. Maybe the Lasat switched to a different energy source or ran out of what they used for the original purple models. We actually see a couple of Magna Guards throughout Clone Wars wielding yellow electricity on their Electro Staffs. First in Season 4 as Dooku's personal Magna Guards, and in Season 5 as King Rash's Executioners. Nothing has ever differentiated them from the standard ones wielding purple though. I have no idea why the color changed. You would think they'd be better in some way, but four of them zapping Anakin at once still doesn't work and Dooku has to take over and use Force Lightning. Next, in the Jedi games, the Purge Troopers carry Electro Staffs, which seem a little larger but do the same thing. They seem to use the same energy across all other Electro weapons as well as including these dual batons and this Electro Hammer. The Dugs also use Electro Staffs and used blue lightning, but as far as I could tell, there's no effectiveness difference due to color. And then the last type of energy weapon like this was the weapons the Imperial Praetorian Guards wielded in Mando. There's no info on them besides this, so while some of their weapons look similar to the Praetorian Guards weapons we see in Last Jedi, these are purple. It looks like they operate very similarly with individual power cells fueling these electromagnetic features each of them has. We also see Moff Gideon's expandable Electro Staff, which looked absolutely sick. Now besides all these variations of Electro weapons, we also see a purple energy bow. First with the Dathomir Knight Sisters in Clone Wars, and then with Omega in Bad Batch. These were actually similar to the Podracer energy binders. These were operated by a plasma coupler string. In the grip of the bow sits a plasma energy reservoir, and when pulled back creates a plasma arrow to shoot. It can store dozens of arrows, and in close quarters combat you could use the bow string like the arrows. So when you're shooting it, don't touch it. This was all from the Gadgets and Gear book. Now this wraps up the personal purple energy weapons we've seen and moves us to the massive heavy cruiser weapon. Yes, you know the one that I'm talking about, the iconic Malevolence. This cruiser had a special weapon on its sides that was essentially a long range mega ion cannon. This thing could literally take out entire capital ships with one shot. Like a giant EMP, all systems shut down immediately. These super heavy ion cannons were pulse weapons, powered by the ship's reactor like we see in Ultimate Star Wars here, and uses plasma rotors, Energize plasma rotors to charge a massive amount of plasma energy into an ionized state that they could shoot out at their targets. The Malevolence would use this weapon to disable enemy ships and just obliterate them with their standard turbo lasers. Now, so far we have five purple energy weapons, plus the Podracer's energy binders, and five of those weapons will stun you. The energy bow is more lethal and the closest thing to a blaster shooting plasma just the same, but these are lethal. Now, the Hailfire droids we see shooting the purple missiles aren't exactly the same as a purple blaster, but they might not be as different as you'd expect. Typically, missiles are powered by either a solid or liquid fuel, which gets burned, producing the thrust needed to shoot it down the battlefield. I wouldn't be surprised if these homing missiles use something similar to the Tabana gas typically used in blasters. What if these Hailfire missiles use a blaster gas that's more volatile or is specialized for a particular effect, electrical, penetrating, disruption, combustion, and what if it's similar to what's used in the Geonosian Starfighters? The payload in these missiles are so explosive that one of these things is taking down brand spanking new ATTEs. That is crazy! Now for the actual purple blasters. The Geonosians have always kept to themselves. That's the one thing they wanted most, was just for the rest of the galaxy to leave them alone. And their starfighters were designed with that one thing in mind. They never invaded, they never carried the fight to their enemies, they just defended their homeworld. But they defended it with as much aggression as they possibly could. These starfighters were actually a defensive ship, with their biggest feat being the propulsion system, this engine orb, as well as their weapon system, this single laser cannon, was separated from the rest of the craft. Each rotated in its own socket independently from the rest of the ship, with strong superconducting magnets which resulted in lightning fast and frictionless movements, which gave the ship true vectored thrust. This allowed the fighters to move and change direction extremely quickly with immediate response. It resembled a small predatory fish striking at its targets. 
and since the vehicle barely produced any glow, it was able to move an attack without giving away its position and it was considered a stealth vehicle, and the Geonosians would use this to their advantage and ambush their opponents in the asteroid field surrounding their planet. And the tech in these starfighters was some of the most alien even for Star Wars. The pilots were actually raised from birth and were bonded to a specific starfighter's flight computer that would increase reaction time during combat. The pilots wore a mask that flight controllers could send different pheromone smells through to change the pilot's objective. Objectives. That's also how they received Vitals information from the ship. There was 100 small tractor beam projectors inside the long nose of these starfighters to guide laser fire to be incredibly accurate. Now on top of all of this, I can only wonder about the tech behind these purple laser cannons they used. And since they were extremely resourceful from the planet itself, I wonder if there's some part of Geonosis they harvested or mined to create this signature purple. Because you know who else was like this? The Gungans. Ooh. They were extremely resourceful with the planet of Naboo. They used naturally occurring plasma energy deposits from the planet itself as the basis for powering all of their technology. The local bubble spore and low cap plants partially digest raw plasma which the Gungans then further process and it becomes a renewable energy source that barely produces any inert gas in its final stage. And this is the plasma in their blue balls, it also is the energy that powers their massive shields and all of their bubble technology, and not only that but it's also what they use to power their personal energy shields, which are also purple. And while we're on the topic, do you know who else uses Naboo's naturally occurring plasma? That's right, the Naboo Royal Guard. In fact, File 44, it mentions that this weapon, the CR2, uses highly charged plasma usually more expensive to produce and was a little unstable for modern standards. That's why everyone else stopped using the weapon. But it says the special ammunition needed to shoot the gun was created cheaply using the naturally occurring and more stable plasma found on Naboo. How interesting. One type of plasma could create green bolts, blue plasma, and purple energy. Interesting. Also, the Umbarans ended up using plasma weapon technology similar to the Gungans. They were also one of the only people using green blaster bolts during this time. Umbara's main resource for mining was dunium though, a heavy metal used to build starships. I wouldn't be surprised if they also had local resources that they took advantage of to develop a higher quality blaster bolt. Wookiees also used green bolts during this time, but Kashyyyk mainly only ever got mined by the Empire for its tree and lumber in the Aftermath book. I have no idea how they got their green blaster bolts. It kind of makes you wonder if all the yellow blaster bolts we see the Mandalorians use came from the mines of Mandalore. I mean, that's where they mined all the Beskar ore from. Even their moon of Concordia had ore deposits that they would mine. I wouldn't be surprised if these were derived from Beskar ore to give them some Beskar penetrating qualities or something. Now, just like the Gungans who mastered plasma tech long ago, the Geonosians had to do the same and developed their own tech that became their sonic weaponry that we see them use. Their sonic blaster was originally developed by Geonosian gunsmiths from mining technology. The original sonic hammers were used to help break rocks to dig the foundations for their hives, factories, and their underground caves and tunnels. And Geonosis itself surprisingly does have resources that could possibly lead to the unique purple blasters. The planet is ridden with harsh winds and occasional downpours that lead to flash flooding, and the badlands are baked by radiation, thick high altitude fog, and frequent meteoroids that have been so big that when they hit the planet, the dust cloud is so massive it covers the planet making it extremely cold and has multiple times caused mass extinctions. There's also cosmic ray storms and some of the creatures have bioluminescent markings to attract mates in the darkness from the heavy fog. Geonosis has a weak magnetic field so the sunlight is unfiltered and extremely harmful. Harmful charged high energy particles batter the surface and during turbulent solar activity the radiation storms engulf the planet sterilizing the surface. Life can only survive underground, except for red rock algae. They're tiny organisms that have colonized the entire surface and give the planet its red hue. Now, Geonosis has two asteroid belts that surround it that were from the planet's largest moon. A comet hit it and turned it into the debris field that we see it as today. But these asteroids are rich in metals and provide a valuable source of raw materials for manufacturing operations on the planet. They actually provided all the raw materials they needed for the war industry. That's where the battle droids came from. And they were dangerous and costly to mine, but using them led to lower production costs and allowed them to maintain a super low profile around their entire operation. They would bring the asteroids down to the surface, grind them up, and then smelt them in order to separate the different minerals. 
Any waste was siphoned off for disposal while the remaining molten metal was poured into large vats. They were then poured into different molds, pounded into shapes by these machines, and then trimmed and shaped by laser cutting tools. The different components were then combined, putting brains in the droids heads and welding them onto the torsos. The planet's chief export was battle droids. After the Battle of Naboo, the Senate banned the use of droid forces, but Poggle the Lesser secretly continued manufacturing their droid army for Newt Gunray and the Trade Federation. It is totally possible that the asteroids around Geonosis had a special mineral or something that led to the discovery of their signature purple blaster bolts. But I actually found something interesting about another purple energy on the Battle of Geonosis. We're going to put a pin in it for like two minutes to talk about the next purple blasters we see in Star Wars. The next time we see purple blaster bolts is actually in the Battlefront games, which actually might be the most informative differentiator of all the sources we have. These special purple blaster bolts were only available for use after you unlock them. Yeah, that's right. There were special award weapons for the blaster rifle, pistol, sniper, and shotguns. So once you get X amount of kills or headshots in one life, it gave you access to the same weapons, but they fired purple blaster bolts and did increase damage. There's no official stats for health and weapon damage in the game, except for this one mention of it in the official game guide. Here it says the health pickups dropped by engineers increase your health by 50 ticks, which for most of the classes is half of your health bar, meaning most have 100 ticks of health. So based on that and using an ammunition droid as target practice, we can see just how much damage these upgraded purple blaster bolts do. If you get 12 kills with a blaster rifle that usually does 18 damage per blast, you unlock the elite assault rifle that has burst fire and does 36 damage per blast. It literally doubles your damage. Do you remember we were talking about the light spectrum? How purple light has twice as much energy as red light? Red light has the longest wavelength at around 700 nanometers and purple is 380 nanometers, which is just over twice as much energy. So in my head cannon, you're just swapping out the blaster gas and switching the setting on your weapon to burst. If you get six pistol kills, you unlock the precision pistol that goes from 10 ticks per shot to 36 ticks per shot. This is three and a half times more powerful. The sniper rifle upgrade is a particle beam rifle that shoots this steady beam of purple and goes from 72 damage to 157 so just more than double as powerful. And sadly, the shotgun turns into the flechette shotgun and does just 10% more damage. It goes from 125 to 143. Most of these are all insane bump ups in power minus the shotgun. Jango Fett is also in the game, wielding the new Wester 33, not to be confused with the sick Wester 34s that we see in Attack of the Clones. His Wester 33 actually shoots purple blaster bolts from it, and it does do 36 damage per shot, which is just as much as the elite blaster rifle, but by far the biggest and baddest purple weapon in this game is the MagnaGuard's Bulldog Rocket Launching Rifle. Yup, you heard me, this is technically not shooting actual blaster bolts that are purple, but anti-infantry homing rockets. But the rockets still need fuel to burn once they're fired, and it's totally possible the fuel and explosives in the rocket are the same. This quick fire launcher holds 6 explosive rockets in a clip before needing to be reloaded and does a whopping 477 damage. It completely destroyed our little ammunition droid and can almost take out med droids in one shot. This is insane! I did notice that sometimes enemies will brush off a hit from this without flinching, and so I did a little testing and learned that the distance between you and your targets affects the damage in the opposite way that you would expect. Technically, it should insta-kill almost every trooper in the game with this damage output. If you're far away, it can one-shot a med droid, which is around 484 damage per shot, but if you walk right up to it and shoot it point blank, the med droid will eat the rocket and keep giving you health. It does 25% less damage if you're standing next to your target, and it seems to scale down with actual enemies. It'll take 50 to 75% of their health away and kill you in the process. Super weird, but at long range, its power is impressive. Next, we see one of the most recent Purple Blaster additions to the universe in Clone Wars Season 7. On Skako Minor, Watt Tambor deploys a new variant of the Octopara Tridroids we see on Christophsis, but this time, they fly now. They fly now! And not only do they fly now, but they also shoot this cool purple beam out instead of the standard laser cannons we normally see them fire. These are concentrated beams that almost seem to have an explosive effect when they hit something. And if you look closely, it also looks like they have some sort of electrical element to them as well. This actually looks similar to the MagnaGuard's purple electricity on their electrostaffs. Not that they would need to stun their enemies when they're exploding them, but maybe there's different settings where they can disable a vehicle from escaping without blowing it to smithereens. Or maybe it's ionized to do more damage to vehicles and large weapons. And funny enough, this variation is called the Magna Tridroid. It's crazy to think that this is the only time we've ever seen these, and it was to wipe out some primitives. 
I feel like these would be extremely useful in battles like Christophsis where the CIS was getting obliterated from long range cannons. They could have secretly sent a couple of these around the battlefield to outflank them and destroy the Republic's cannons from behind. But either way, these look extremely powerful. In the same episode, Watt Tambor introduces a new weapon called the Decimator that shoots lethal purple electrical tentacles out that search for organic matter. We never actually get to see the effects of this weapon in the episode because it was too gruesome and they had to cut it, but luckily they released it as a deleted scene still in previs, and holy cow was it brutal. The purple energy tentacles would search out until they found living matter and then focus all the other tentacles onto it until it vaporized the target. This is pretty brutal and I can see why they cut it from the episode because it's a kids TV show, but it still would have been cool to see it happen in the show. I wonder if Tambor used the same energy source to power the decimator as he used in the Tridroids beam weapons. I wonder if they had incinerating effects on top of the explosive and electrical. Now, do you remember the other purple energy on Geonosis we put a pin in two minutes ago? Well, I noticed that the Techno Union starships also have purple emissions from their rocket engines. These starships were the opposite of efficient. They used an insane amount of fuel, but this wasn't a concern because the Skakoans, the founders of the Techno Union, had three moons in their system that provided the fuel for all of their needs. And what a coincidence! These are the same people who also used the Decimator and the Magna Tridroids that shot purple. I think it's more than safe to assume that they were using the fuel from their moons to not just power their starships, but all of their weapons. Skako's methane atmosphere was deadly to most of the galaxy's life forms, and the Skakoans harnessed the power of their atmosphere to improve their technology and cover their planet with industry. Methane was a plentiful and a powerful fuel source. Metallic resources are abundant, and oxygen was a controllable and useful waste product, although it was a flammable toxin. And it also says that with rich resources, especially of methane and metals, the Skakoans had plenty to build and experiment with. Also, due to solar radiation striking the dense atmosphere, the upper layers became an alkaline haze. It remains highly probable that the purple energy came from the methane or special metals on Skako or one of its moons. And I absolutely love this theory. It's completely pieced together, but slowly I just kept finding more and more to back it up. And now finally for the one and only on-screen handheld blaster we see shoot purple blaster bolts is from the Book of Boba Fett. Like a bantha. Yes. This member of the mods has a very unique pistol. Not only does it shoot this beautiful purple blast, but it also has this tiny little detail that I absolutely love. A couple frames before the weapon is fired, this coil on the top of it heats up and glows purple for a couple frames, and then after you shoot it, purple sparks fly out the back like a flintlock pistol. The attention to detail that went into this one gun is amazing. Props to whoever did this, I love it. And at first, I could not figure out for the life of me why this one seemingly small side character in the show got the only blaster pistol that we've ever seen that shoots purple. Well, I mean, there was that one bounty hunter in the Rebels comic, Eyes on the Prize. This Athorian has this cool blaster rifle that shoots purple blast, but this was literally the one panel that we ever get to see of it. This mod is the only on-screen purple blaster, but why? Originally, I wondered if it was a similar scenario, or at very least a head nod to Samuel L. Jackson getting his purple saber. You might get purple. He literally just asked George Lucas for it so he could see himself stand out in the big fight, and look where it got him. I wondered if the actor, Jordan Bulger, just asked Robert Rodriguez if he could have a purple blaster, so I asked him. And honestly, his answer kind of surprised me. He said that he had no idea. It's honestly kind of funny, because I guess that clears that up. There's no canon explanation, but I can't help but feel it was a head nod to Mace Windu getting a purple blaster. And I can't complain because it's the coolest looking blaster in the entire show. I wonder if this character, Scad, bought some illegal blaster gas off the black market to stand out since we know that they like to do that. Or maybe he bought a special color crystal that changes his blaster's color from the mod parlor. The only actual explanation we ever get for these more rare blaster colors is from this book called Star Wars Super Graphic from 2017. Here it lists all the colors and says red is the most common color because it's made from cheaper gas. Which honestly, we just spent a half hour talking about spin sealed Tabana gas and why it's so expensive, so I don't know about that. It says that green blaster bolts came from a higher quality gas which makes it more expensive, no more context, just higher quality apparently. 
I mean, in fact file 45 it says that turbo lasers use Tabana gas, so grain of salt with this book. It says the blue is ion based energy charges, more effective against droids and machines, orange is non fatal low power training bolts, and then yellow and purple it actually has nothing to say about, it just says who uses them. So while we don't know everything about Star Wars and its technology, from what we do know is that blasters can change color based on X amount of things. Purple is the most rare color we've seen with the fewest instances of it ever being used and the least amount of knowledge on its origins, but putting pieces together we can kind of come to conclusions on what it actually does. The Magna Guard's Electro Staffs, the Praetorian Guard Weapons, the Bow Rifle, the Malevolence, the Decimator, and the Pod Racer's Energy Binders will all shock you. They will either make your hand go numb for hours or send so much electricity through your body it will tear a hole in you or vaporize you. And the Magna Tridroids look like they have some kind of electrical charge, but they also seem to be quite explosive, as well as the shots from the Geonosian Starfighters. Even Scad's pistol seems to be a little more violent than it should be. I feel like there's a pretty good chance that purple blasts would indicate high powered bolts with an explosive or electrical punch to them, most times doing twice as much damage as red bolts. I'm sure they could most likely penetrate armor and still be explosive. I want it to be some secret black market blaster gas like SIG that S3 has to monitor that you can get rewarded to use in Battlefront when you do well, but it could very well also just be crystals they're using. In Star Wars The Old Republic, that's all it was. The blaster bolt color was purely aesthetic. Lightsabers and blasters alike used color crystals to change the look but not the effectiveness of the weapon. You could take crystals out of modded guns or craft them and use them in your guns to change the blaster color. If you have a blue color crystal, you put it in your gun and make it shoot blue blaster bolts. Purely cosmetic here. You actually use the same color crystals to change lightsaber color as you do blaster color. And there is so many different variations. But honestly, I kind of like that the purple blaster bolts are so rare in Star Wars. In a world as big as this, it feels nice that some things are still so special. I really hope that you enjoyed the video, subscribe and send this to your Star Wars friends, and remember, the Force will be with you, always.